Welcome to the Overcoming Adversity podcast, where it's all about a transformational growth and having a resilient mindset. I'm your host, Michael Allison. I just want to thank you for just being here and joining us to be on the podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel before you do anything else. Today we have on the show a really good friend of mine. He's the CEO of his own brand, Dan, Danny Covey. He's a marketer and a graphic designer who's also been through his own fair share of adversities. This guy had eight heart surgeries. Let's welcome to the show my good friend, Mr. Danny Covey. All right. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, that was a good introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the uh, husband of one fantabulous wife, I'm a father of three amazing kids. And like you said, I'm survivor of eight open heart surgeries. Man, Danny, thank you so much for being here, man. Um, I totally have tons of huge respect for you, man. And I just want to acknowledge you for um, just showing up and being here. And then to add on to what we, we just spoke about, man, you're a, you're a dad and a husband. So you have multiple, multiple different responsibilities, man, to to add on to all of the things that you've been through. So I'd like to just hop into it, man. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and what was that like and why did you have heart surgery? What was going on, bro? Yeah, well, um, like you said, it it has been a journey and I've kind of called it my open heart journey. Um, my first surgery actually was when I was 14 months old and I've had surgeries at 14 months, 18 months, when I was eight, when I was 12, 13, 14. And then my last surgery was when I was 40. And really my surgeries, my story begins with my parents. And so when I was just under a year old, I started having multiple fainting spells where I would stop breathing, not getting any air. My parents rushed me to the hospital and they didn't really know what was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that happened two, three, four, five, six times. And during that time, my parents saw different cardiologists. They saw different doctors. Every single one of the cardiologists and doctors said, there's something wrong. We're not sure what it is. And finally, it was the 11th doctor that they saw that said, he's got a severe heart problem. We need to fly him across the country to Sick Kids Hospital. And Sick Kids Hospital is world famous in uh, central Ontario. And so I was flown there for an experimental surgery in 1978. I was given a 20% chance to live. And I don't want to spoil it. I lived. But uh, it's uh, it the word miracle gets thrown around a lot, but it is an absolute miracle that I survived that surgery. It was highly experimental, and they determined that I had problems with my aortic valve and my mitral valve, and they were able to repair them at that time. Wow. So that surgery was I don't even remember that one. But I remember growing up seeing scars on my arm and my chest. I didn't know what they were from. I knew I'd had surgery, but I didn't really understand. I had a few seasons or a few years of calm. And then again, when I was eight years old, um, my parents said, we need just let's let's see the cardiologist, make sure everything's working okay. They did a catheterization, which is a very small heart surgery just to kind of explore and see what was wrong. And then they realized there's, there's something wrong with my aortic valve. It was enlarged. It was pumping blood. It wasn't getting enough blood or oxygen. And so when I was eight, I started going into congestive heart failure. And my parents knew that without another surgery, another open heart surgery, I would die very soon. So I had that surgery at eight and I recovered but there were complications. So, were, there, were there symptoms prior to you having the surgery? Or they just yeah. said, your parents just said, let's go to the doctor? No, it was almost a preventative thing. Okay. They almost, okay. It okay. was almost like, well, everything's good, but let's just double check. Okay. Okay. And the timing of that was, uh, it was, it was an act of God because wow. literally they said, wow, you're on the verge of going into congestive heart failure. And once wow. I did, I was fainting. I was gaining a lot of weight from fluid retention. I, I couldn't breathe. I had to carry an oxygen tank around. So things got very bad very quickly when I was eight. 
So I had that surgery. They repaired my valve, um, but there were complications. My valve kept constricting small. So it would, they'd open it up and then it would constrict again. And so I had a ballooning procedure done on my aortic valve when I was 12. And the surgery bought me a little bit of time, but mm -hmm. it was not successful. And so when I was 13, I started going into congestive heart failure again. And finally, the doctor said, you know, rather than trying to expand the valve, we're going to remove it and put in an artificial valve. So part of me was terrified, but part of me was like, this is awesome. I'm going to be like the bionic man. I'm going to have <laughs> machine parts. And when I was 14, I, two days after my birthday, I had that valve put in. And for the first time in my life, suddenly I had good health. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I was recovered and I was able to do things. And even with that surgery, I nearly died. It was very touch and go. It was, they weren't sure if I was going to live or not. I was having excessive bleeding. The bleeding stopped and I recovered. And that's when as a 14 year old kid, I'm like, now I can actually do things. I don't know why, but the thing I zeroed in on was like, I want to do martial arts. Um, between 1985 and 1990, I had five heart surgeries. So five surgeries in five years. And I wanted to do something physical. So I got into martial arts uh, against my parents' wishes, against my cardiologist's wishes. And the, uh, the only caveat they said was you can't spar in competitions. You can train, but no, no competitions. So I'm like, that's fine. That's great. So I did karate growing up. Um, life happened. I got married, had kids, went to college, all of that. And then in my 30s, I got back into it. I got into yeah. Japanese jiu-jitsu and loved it. And then in 2017, I started noticing, man, training is getting really hard. I'm having trouble breathing. I started gaining a lot of weight again. Mm. And when I had uh, a checkup with my cardiologist, my aortic arch was enlarged. And when I had surgery, it actually ruptured. Wow. So I actually had an aortic aneurysm uh, at the beginning of the surgery. And if, if, if your listeners know anything about that, that's something people do not come back from. Mm -hmm. And apart from a miracle from God, there's no reason in the world why I should be here. And that's the only reason I survived. My surgeon, he, he was just in shock. He's like, we had a plan for the surgery. And then as soon as your arch burst, the plan changed and it was just, it was just, we're trying to save your life. Oh, geez. So that was, uh, in 2017. Since then, my health is good. I've been able to get back into martial arts and I can talk a bit more about that later, but yeah, my health has been good then since then. So that's kind of a really quick overview from like when I was a baby to, to now. Okay, Danny. You're one of my newest heroes, bro. <laughs> um, how on earth? Wow. How on earth? As you as you're telling your story, right? And you're mm -hmm. thinking about it like you're here by an act of God, miracle, knowing that you've been close to death almost every single surgery, every single surgery that you've been you, you you've experienced yeah what is that thought what is that feeling knowing that you've been through all of these experiences and you're still here standing what does that feel like you know what uh, to be candid for the longest time it didn't it was just my my life i didn't really think about it it was just so much of my childhood and growing up was just oh you need another surgery mm. and i didn't i didn't think about it as I got older, reflecting back, I thought, this is kind of unique. I, it I never really thought about it. Uh, it was just something you had to face. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a quote that I like. Uh, Richard Paul Evans says, usually life's greatest gifts come wrapped in adversity. 
And that is 100% true. Um, after being through all these surgeries, it sounds weird. I don't think I'd go back and change it because I don't think I'd be the same person. Uh, I've had to learn to fight for things. And it's kind of taught me too that everybody suffers. Everyone suffers. It's a human universal. Yeah. All of us will go through something. Um, and what really helped get me through a lot of this was just believing that there is a purpose to my suffering. It's not just random. It's not just haphazard. There is a reason why I'm going through this. And if I can learn that reason, that will help me go through it well. Right. Danny, this started at, at obviously at a very super young age. And you telling me that you weren't able to do like physical contact, those types of things. Can you let's talk about what, what was that like for you as a kid? Do you felt like you missed out on your childhood a little bit, that sort of thing? Or was it your childhood normal when it came to like friends and playing? football, your basketball, your hockeys, those, any types of things that normal kids would go through. How, how was that for you, man? That was tough because I, I was, I was the kid that was never like, I, I didn't get cut from the team. I wasn't even there to get cut. I kind of joke. I never knew my gym teacher. Like I heard he was a really nice guy, but I've never met them, any of them. And so if it was gym class, it was always like, all right, Danny, you can get up and be excused now. And I'd go to the library and draw. I'd do something else. And that, that I found tough because as a kid, you want to fit in. Sports is an amazing opportunity to bond. All right. I wasn't there. Uh, my brother-in-law taught me how to shoot a basketball when I was in my early 20s because I never played. I never, wow. I never got into team sports because I was just – it was something that wasn't even on my radar. So for me, my escaping into my imagination and back then I would draw a lot. Mm -hmm. That was my escape. And that was my world. That was like, my imagination was my playground. Wow. But it was hard. So being around kids, right? I know that kids could be cruel and kids could be mean. Did Kids treat you a certain way, aside from sports. Let's just say, for example, you're in class, or or you're doing on you're going on a field trip, these types of things. Or I, I think about for myself, you know, when kids would get really a uh, really up and things like that, or whatever it may be. Did the, did your parents go to school and say, "Hey, my son, my son has a condition. He, he cannot." get into a fight. Nobody can't bullying. Nobody can touch them. These types of things. That's what I'm thinking. So did your parents have to like put those precautions out there and tell the principals, tell all your teachers, did that have to have to happen for you? Yeah, absolutely. That did happen. Uh, especially when I was younger, like around eight and, um, uh, it's a tough age, but I would start to go into congestive heart failure. I'd put on a lot of weight. So I got mm -hmm. teased and my parents did step in and say, look, just tell the other kids to ease off because there are severe health issues going on. Mm -hmm. So I did get teased a bit, but I was also very likable. I like to joke around a lot and I could draw. Mm -hmm. So I could draw too, man. Yeah. So I would draw pictures for people. So they'd bully me and I'd say, Hey, what you, what's your favorite thing? You know, I like go bots. I'm like, okay, they're stupid, but I'll draw them for you. Right. <laughs> so I was, I was, um, well liked and I was able to do things that kind of helped me bond with other kids. But yeah, I did get teased uh, sometimes. So what was this experience like for your, for your parents? I know that maybe, I don't know if they discussed this with you at a younger age, but at any point, did they ever talk to you about their emotional well being, going through this, seeing their sons going through this issue and stuff like that? What was that like for them? So my, my dad had told me, uh, cause he was in the hospital around a lot of other parents mm -hmm. and the statistic was parents that have really sick children, even if the children don't pass away from the illness, it creates a massive amount of friction and a lot of, uh, marriages up to 90% of them fall apart because there's just so much stress surrounding the situation. Right. And my parents were. Um, they had a relationship with God. It was a deep and meaningful relationship. 
And that is what helped anchor them through it. And they they still say it was a roller coaster. One day we thought we'd, you'd live. The next day we thought we're going to lose our son. Mm-hmm. They remained optimistic, <clears throat> but realistic because they knew the odds were not in their favor. They believed in the power of prayer. They were open to, if I don't make it, okay, they'll they'll walk through that. But that is an aspect I didn't really understand until I had kids. Mm-hmm. And once I had children of my own, I thought there's no way I could imagine one of my children going through what I went through. I would rather be the patient 100% of the time rather than see them go through that. I I asked you that question and I wanted to follow up because I had a conversation with a friend of mine a couple of years ago. Nothing as traumatic as your experience. And but their kid had to have a a surgery. Mm -hmm. And financially, they couldn't handle it. And they struggled in regards to making ends meet and stuff like that. So I was saying that to you as in like, what if there was an added layer? Was there an added layer in regards to like your bills, going to the doctor, your treatment, insurance, all these types of things that comes with additional stresses that you know that your parents have to carry? You know, so I was wondering, did any of that impact your parents or not? You know, but I just recall having that conversation with a friend of mine and they shared that. Mm-hmm. That was, that was definitely a factor. Our healthcare in Canada is a little bit differently. Okay. A little bit different. So for some of the expenses related to my surgeries, my parents did pay for mm-hmm. a lot of the expenses. They did not have to pay because we have a, a form of socialized medicine. So our taxes are much higher. Mm -hmm. But for health situations, like in my case, um, that layer of stress, financial stress, was not there like it would be in some other countries. Okay. But um, I know my surgeries, uh, if I combine them, have been in the millions of dollars (laughs) easily. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's a big GoFundMe. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I uh, I want to share a quick story with you. Yeah. A good friend of mine is in uh, Idaho. Actually, he's in California, but I met him in Idaho. And he does exactly what happens to you. So he's re- he's he used to work corporate and did a lot of cool things in um, California, but he has his own private jet. And he made it his mission to help people just like you. So he created a company. And mm-hmm. any kid that needs surgery, you name it, that needs it at the at the at a split of a dime or anything, um, he's coming to pick you up and he's taking you to that hospital to save your life. And I just want to share that with y'all. Like, I really like salute that guy for just thinking that way in regards to what I'm going to do with my time, what I'm going to do with my money. He could go mm-hmm. be sitting on the beach or something like that, but he chose to do some cool stuff like that. And I thought about the person that did that for you, which was pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. So. You're a dad now. What is that like knowing that you were a kid before and you had all these different types of experience? What is that with you and your uh, your uh, kid now? And like, what is that dynamic? What is that relationship like? And then are you telling them some of the stories and some of the things that you've been through? That sort of thing. Yeah. So it's, it's funny you say that. Like, um, I'll just share a brief story. My My youngest son, when he was about two, mm-hmm. uh, he was playing soccer. It was a hot day outside and he had a seizure mm-hmm. and um, we didn't know what was wrong. We just saw him seizing up. We called an ambulance. They're rushing him to the hospital. And that's when I got a taste of, okay, this is a little bit what my parents went through time and time and time and time again. My last surgery when I was uh, in 2017, I was 40 years old at the time. That is the first time my kids actually went through this with me, where my wife went through it with me. And I've always told them the stories. They'd say, Daddy, tell me about your scar. But I don't think it really connected because it wasn't real. It was just a story. All right. 
And so they got to see me at my worst. I'm struggling to stay alive in hospital. They're coming to visit me. They've, they've never been in the hospital uh, to date. All of my kids have been very healthy. So it kind of, in a way, it was like the legends are true. Like they're, they're hearing all these stories and now they're actually seeing it. And my daughter, who's 17 now, uh, we were talking last week and she's like, dad, she says, you've always been a parent, but now I'm starting to see you as a person. And I think it's just the layers of this. It's starting to sink in where they're like, humanize you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you got into jujitsu, you got into karate. And you also spoke about you, you have had to gone through this experience for a reason, Mm -hmm. right? What do you believe is now based off how, where you're at now in life, your, your father, your husband, you have a successful business going right now, right? What do you think is like your purpose based off what you've experienced throughout your entire life at this moment, man? As I've gone through a lot of this, um, I don't think you'll ever get an answer to the why me question. Mm. It's the first question you're going to ask. Why is this happening to me? Why did I have this health problem? Uh, But you're never going to get a satisfactory answer. The question you will get answers to, and I've always tried to remember this, is what is this teaching me? So when I was younger, couldn't do sports. What am I doing instead? I'm drawing. I'm being creative. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what I do full time now? I've honed that skill. And so I've always tried to ask whether, you know, I'm on the, the operating table and I'm recovering and it's painful and it's difficult or I have uh, cognitive challenges. I've always said, what is, what is this teaching me? God, what are you trying to teach me in this situation? And there was a quote that I came across uh, maybe two or three years ago. And the first time I heard this quote, I actually started crying because it hit me so hard. This is why we go through hard times. And the quote was, oh, let me see if I can get it right. One day you will tell your story of how you're going, how you've overcome what you're going through now, and it will become part of somebody else's survival guide. And that hit me hard because I realized if I can go through this trauma, this health crisis, and come through it well and do well and flourish on the other side of it, be resilient, have fortitude, struggle my way through. Somebody over there needs to see that. Somebody over there needs to see me do well. And it just it just crystallized when I heard that. That's why we go through trials because you know what? There's people I've looked to that have been through horrible things and they were an inspiration and a hope to me. And now I'm being called upon to be that for somebody else. Man, so as you're telling me that, I hope that there's a book coming out. I've seen your YouTube. Uh, We're going to try to attach it to um, this podcast. But I hope that there's a book coming out and it gets to share your story. There's a book that I read, and as soon as you're telling me that it resonated with me, it's called Struggle Well. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the invisible scars that we don't see during war. And if I was to look at you, Danny, like I, don't, I see a normal guy, right? But you were saying that your kids see your scars, right? And I'm just thinking about of all these surgeries that you had, how many times that somebody had to cut you and do surgery on you. Yep. Not knowing what, uh, not knowing what the outcome is gonna be as much as we wanna be hopeful. And I just think there's so much stories to the scars that are on your body, man. So yep. is there a book coming out? Let's talk about if you have a book coming out. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the story. So there was a friend of mine. He and his wife were trying to have children. 
and they lost the baby about, uh, this probably was about three, three and a half years ago. And he's an artist and he said, can I want to write a children's book to help kind of deal with some of this. He says, can we just go for a walk and let me just bounce some ideas off you. So we went on like a two hour walk and he's just talking and he's crying and he's sharing some of his ideas. And towards the end of the talk, or our walk, I said, you know, I'm, I've, I've had ideas in my head too, for several years, maybe I'll write someday. I always thought I was too young. I'm not old <laughs> enough to write a book, right? But I got back to my house that night. And I just sat down at my computer and I started making just ideas, like writing down ideas and notes. And after, I don't know, two or three hours, I had 12 pages of just ideas and notes. And that's when I sat on it for a couple of days and I thought, yeah, I got something to say. Yeah. And after that, I had two thoughts and I'm, I'm sure you can identify with this. The first thought was you need to write. And that terrified me. And then the other answer, and then the second thought was you have to write. It's like, once I knew it scared me, then I knew I had to do it. And so I've been writing for the past year and a half. I've got my book edited. I've got a publisher. I'm weeks out from having it published. Mm -hmm. And it really does go into, you know, that whole open heart journey and everything involved with it. And some of the issues that I've struggled with, and I kind of uh, write about it and, and fight through it in the book. And for me, that was um, survivor's guilt where I've seen so many people in horrible situations, uh, whether it be cancer or other health issues, and people are praying for them and they're being strong, they're being resilient. Why did I make it and not them? There's nothing special about me. They didn't deserve to, to die or pass away, but I'm still here. And I really have struggled with that. And I don't know that I ever got a... I don't know if I ever came to an answer, but I've thought through it. And that's kind of what my, my journey is about is, you know, just fighting your way through things and what's the purpose behind it and what can we teach others? So I'm going to share this story with you, bro. So, you know, before off air, I had said this to you. So when I was in Iraq, you know, we got hit by that car bomb. Mm -hmm. And in the book and, Prior to that, I just finished speaking to the gunner that was on that Humvee, my friend Salto, the doc was on there, and my gunny was on there. And I was dropping off uh, supplies, so I gave them some MREs, some water, and some more ammunition. And they're facing, let's say they're facing 12 o'clock, and I'm pulling behind their 12 o'clock towards their 6 o'clock, and I'm about to pull up to their 11 o'clock. As soon as I pull up to their 11 o'clock, the bomb goes off. Five seconds, 10 seconds. That could have been me. And I had my crew on there with me. And obviously, I told you what happened to us, but Salto died. The, the gunner, he lost half of his face. Our doctor lost his leg. My gunny got injured. And I thought that was me. And I struggled with that for years, years. And I had what you just talked about with the survival skill. And it was not until. I went to Rush University to learn all about these things around mental health and to get to that actual, actual, a better space to say. And what we did was we, we, uh, we actually replayed the moment over and 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 over, um, to try to get out of survival's guilt and blaming yourself and all these things and stuff like that. But what I wanted to share was identifying why you're writing this book and telling your story, because I think that's a part of your purpose, mm -hmm. because this book that you're about to write is going to help so much people based off of your experience, man. I think bro, I got chills after you tell, told me about your story, man. And I just imagine how many people, you know, how many parents that have kids that wake up with so many issues or, or born with so many issues that is, this is going to resonate with. 
You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, man, you're gonna help so many people, man. Um, you know how many kids that parents are dealing with something like this or experience something like this that you share this story. Oh, my dad is human. You know what I mean? So I, I think, um, bro, you're on the right path. When the book comes out, hopefully by the time this podcast drops, it's out so we can share the link. But when it does come out, please share it with me so I can go out and get a copy as well, man. Yeah, no, that'll be awesome. And and like you said, like you go through hard things, people need to know about it. And if it scares you, it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you realize, man, am I up to the challenge? Am I up to the task? And like you said, like it's this is not for me. This is for other people. If this is my legacy, if this book is the one thing that I do, then it was worth it. So I want to hop into what we just kind of spoke about, kind of like a tough topic for some people. Mm-hmm. But you spoke about survival's guilt. And did you experience anything in addition to that? And what was that like for you? So did you experience any like going through surgery, coming through surgery, going through surgery, coming through surgery. Did you start feeling depressed, any anxiety or, you know, any of these things that we start, we we would contribute as mental health types of issues. Did you experience any of those things? And uh, did it affect you? If not, what was that like? hundred percent. Like I had mentioned earlier, between 1985, 1990, I had five surgeries. And I was, you know, young kid to a teenager during that time. And you go through it. And I I distinctly remember there was a season where it was very dark because every surgery I had, you kind of hope, well, this will fix the problem. And then you move on. And every surgery I had, it seemed like, well, this will get you through for another year. This will get you through for another six months. And that was very hard. And it wasn't until I was an adult looking back on the situation that you really realize that had a profound effect on me. As a kid, you don't know. You don't understand. You're just like, well, I guess this is what I go through. But I remember when I was eight, um, after my second open heart surgery, I actually had a mini stroke. Mm -hmm. And I forgot a lot of short-term memory things. So I had to relearn my multiplication table. Uh, Canada, we do a lot of skating. I had to relearn how to skate. There were all these things that I had just forgotten how to do. And when I was eight, it's not a big deal now, but when I was eight, I was losing clumps of hair. Mm-hmm. And so we, my parents took me to the doctor and they were asking about it. And they're like, well, we think this is due to stress. And I remember asking the doctor, well, I don't have anything to be stressed about. Because as a kid, you just, I went through this thing. Now I'm healed. You don't, you process things very different, but I think 100% my body was acting in a stressed way. It's just as a child, you're not really perceiving it the same. Looking back, I thought, yeah, I was hundred percent stressed. My body was acting that way. So yeah, it had a huge impact. I was just saying that all I could think about was, Someone saying that, hey, you got about six months to live, eight months to live. And to think mentally that there's a ticking time bomb, sort of kind of like I'm about to expire. Like, like we know that we're all going to die one day, but we don't know that. Right. So yeah. it's out there. But like when somebody actually says that to you and say, hey, um, we, we only could give your son six more months, eight more months. And man, it's, it's going to be so amazing. Like you're still standing here, man, over 40 <laughs> yeah. Well, I will, I will add this. Um, it's been an, it's been interesting to me because I remember being on the operating table every time as a, and as an eight year old, they're putting me to sleep and I'm thinking I could be dead in a few minutes Wow. as an eight year old. And then revisiting that same thought again, when I'm 13 and then 14. And it was interesting because when I was 40, I'm on the operating table again, and they're putting you to sleep. And it's just having that realization now as an adult, I could be dead in a, in in a few short moments that this could be it. So I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I also think 
it challenges your priorities. It does tell you well, what's really important. And so I'm glad to have had that experience to face that at different ages, mm -hmm. at different levels of understanding. Uh, even my relationship with God, like what does an eight-year-old understand? Very little, but they have an understanding. And just to revisit that over the years, it's it's been um, a mixed blessing. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I'm glad to have had that experience. So, Danny, how do you... How do you keep fighting? How do you never give up? Despite all of these surgeries that you face, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, how do you keep fighting and never give up? I, I, well, that's a hard question to answer. I, I would say I never looked at myself as a victim, number one. Like, yes, have I been victimized? Sure. Am I a victim? No. And I've had, I've held on to the belief, I've held on to faith that God has a purpose for this. But I also believe that sometimes faith is just pure stubbornness. <laughs> so when I was told you'll never be able to do sports or martial arts, part of me was like, you watch me, mm -hmm. even though it was ridiculous. And as a kid, like I watched Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee and I, I was like blown away. And so for me, you know, not giving up, I said, all right, dad, please, please, please. I saw this karate book at the bookstore and I said, please let me buy it. And so he bought it for me and it was step-by-step -step instruction. So I'm standing in front of my bedroom mirror holding this book, trying to do punches and kicks that was my version of just not giving up, even though it was ridiculous. And so it's just this, that little tiny step. So I've, I, after my last surgery, I've started walking. My first walk was four minutes. And then I took a two hour nap because it wiped me out. Wow. But it was just, okay, next day I'm going to do six minutes. And it's for me, it has been, I'm not a victim. I never will see myself as, as a victim. I will never ask for special treatment. Uh, and I haven't. Uh, when I started martial arts as an adult, I didn't tell my instructors I had a heart condition for about a year. And when they found out, because I was like running out of air, they were furious. They're like, you need to tell us. I'm like, I didn't want special treatment. Mm. So... I don't know what that drive is to not give up. I just thought, look, even if I'm going to walk tomorrow, I will run. And the next day I will do more. But today I'm just going to do this tiny little thing. And that's it. Can you talk about advice that you would like to offer someone based off some of the strategies that you just discussed? Like, what was your thought in regards to, I've been through this, so I'm gonna implement this in my daily life. I'm gonna do this monthly. I'm going to, I'm gonna start speaking to family members more. I'm going to um, engage with my wife more. I'm gonna um, take advantage of more trips. I'm gonna get into jujitsu because this could be it. This could be my last time doing these things. What are some strategies that, that you took from your experiences? You may be putting them in your book too as well, that this is what I did and you guys could use this too as well. Yeah, I think um, it's a mind shift change. The first one would be, like I'd mentioned earlier, don't ask why, ask what. And part of the asking what may be, what can I do today? Is there something, do I have a goal for something? And for me, that goal has always been uh, agency, to take control of the things that I can take control and move past them. Because for most of my life, or for a lot of my life, I just, I didn't have control. And I didn't, all I could do was face things. I, And the only thing that I really could control was my attitude. 
That's so exactly. if I can control my attitude, if I can say, well, doesn't matter why this is happening. What am I going to learn from it? The And I guess the, the main thing would be, I kind of, it sounds weird, but I feel like you should do something hard every day, whether it's turning the shower to cold and enduring it mm -hmm. or going and running or working out or doing something physical that challenges or, or engaging something intellectual that challenges your thinking, you should do something hard every day and it something big or small doesn't matter. And that's usually if it scares me, then I'm like, yep, I need to do it. Or if I don't want to do it, or that little voice in the back of your head is like, you're not good enough, you can't do this, then that probably is a thing you need to do. And like I said, um, it can be something small, or you can be something big. Um, when I wanted to get back into martial arts, there was one night I was walking. And it, the walking was part of my cardiac rehab. And I'm slumped over. It hurts to stand up. And I'm feeling sorry for myself because I have no energy and I'm hurting. And it starts raining. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, I will never get back into martial arts. <laughs> like It's just, I can't even lift my legs. I can barely shuffle. A year later, I was back doing it and I got my black belt. But it was because okay, I'm going to stay on the trail five more minutes. Mm. I'm going to do five more minutes more than what I think I can. And I, I don't mean to say you, you don't listen to your body or you don't take good advice, but you do something hard every day, physically, mentally. I love the fact that you were intentional about it too. Um, did you look at incorporating any other like resources such as like, I should get into some counseling. I should uh, get some mentors. I should get some coaches. I need to be around a community of people that has been through some of the same things that I've been through. Did you look to like these types of uh, avenues or anything like that? Oh yeah. Yeah. hundred um, percent. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, after this last surgery, because it was an emergency operation, I didn't have uh, blood or oxygen to my brain for nine minutes. Mm -hmm. So I, I had seen a neurologist months later and I had what they call anoxic brain trauma. And I was so happy to get the diagnosis because for several months, I thought I was just going crazy because I was forgetting things. I was losing things. I'd be walking in my neighborhood and I got lost. I'd be driving to work and I would get lost my, I'd ask my family something and they'd look at me and they'd be like, dad, you just asked me that three times. And I thought I was losing my mind, but I did suffer brain trauma from the surgery and it got challenging with my wife and I, because, you know, I, I like to joke around. I like to, I used to like to be the center of attention and it was taxing on her. And she says, I just wish I had my old husband back because now I'm forgetful. I'm dependent on her for more things. And so hundred percent, I sought counseling and that counseling was a huge resource for me because it was just being able to talk and say, yes, I've got this issue. Now, what are some strategies that I'm going to work on and counseling? Uh, I've read several books that have helped me kind of walk on that road to recovery. And it's not that I'm going to fix my problem. It's just that I'm going to learn to manage it. I'm going to, you're never going to get over a problem. You're going to learn how to, to live with it. Right. Uh, a big strategy that I had is when I get frustrated or forgetful, or I call it a brain fog where it's just like this thing sets in and I can't think cognitively through things. Um, I just stop and I say, I'm frustrated because I'm forgetting something. I just say, like, I'm frustrated. And then the next question is, what am I going to do about it? And then the third thing I say is, is there anything I can be thankful for? Hey, I got lost driving to work, but hey, I can still drive. <laughs> I'm still working. And when I start looking for things to be thankful for, 
then yes, I've got this problem, but we're going to work through it. And that's been a very helpful strategy. Just talking, hearing my thoughts out loud, I think is huge. And writing has been extremely therapeutic as well. I love it, man. Um, I uh, was speaking with somebody else today and we were talking so much about gratitude, journaling, and just living, living just, just living like your life abundantly and declaring a whole bunch of things and affirming things all over your life, man. It makes you so much appreciative when you go through life with that type of mindset. Yep. Yeah, my wife jokes, like I leave the house and she knows I'll be back once or twice. I lost my keys. Where are my keys? Where's this? And it's the joke, but I'm, you know, as I'm frustrated, I'm like, but I can drive. <laughs> but, I, but I found my keys, you know. So it's just the small things to be grateful for. Nice. Let's talk about family, man. How important is it with family supporting you, being around you, and just creating that uh, network of people that's loving you and supporting you and just being there for you, man? My, my family, especially my parents, I look at what they went through with me. I couldn't have gotten through it. They have been a huge support. Um, as an adult going through surgery, my family has been a huge support. My wife has been a, a massive help to me. She's listened to me. She struggled with me. She's helped, you know, help me out of bed when I couldn't move. She's walked with me. She, she, she's done a lot to take care of me. It's having that community where they are supporting you. Maybe they don't understand everything. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But they're there to help you. And probably one of the biggest things, like in marriage wise, in all of this, in the struggle, is actually something my counselor said. Uh, she told me, she said, it's not important that you and your wife think alike because your experiences have been very different. Right. She said, it's important that you think together. So I've nearly died multiple times. My wife's barely been in hospital. We don't have to be on the same wavelength. We just have to walk through life together on right. our different levels. So my family has been an amazing community. My dojo where I train, they've been a huge community for me as well because I go and they're like cheering me on. Yes, you can do this. And sometimes you need that. Uh, my church group, people, friend groups, they've all been there as a support. Um, and that you don't get through life alone at all. Not one bit, man. Not one bit. I wanted to uh, touch on the surgery itself. So I've never actually spoken to anyone that had the type of surgery that you've had. Mm -hmm. So the doctor that the doctors explain to you the process and the procedures of the surgeries and like the side effects. And I'm asking that. And I thought about for myself when I had different types of surgeries and they would tell me that when you come out of the surgery, this is going to happen. This is, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do these types of physical therapy. Um, you, you're going to, you know, I had a hip surgery a couple of years ago. So I, I recall the struggle of what that was like, you know? So I was, I was just curious, how did things affect you after surgery? Did like you lose any, cause you, you talked about like, um, your memory, right? So I was wondering, did you lose anything over with like taste, uh, feeling? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there's um, there's a lot of age appropriate things that they will tell you. Okay. But then the reality of it is very different. I kind of joked about it in in the book I'm writing that everything they don't tell you. So for instance, uh, when I was eight, I had surgery, and they said, "What flavor do you want?" And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're going to put gas on you. You can have chocolate, strawberry, or banana. So I, all right, I'll have strawberry. So they put me to sleep. I'm smelling strawberries. That's the last thing I remember. Unintended side effect. For the next three months, all I smelled was strawberries. Oh. And I hated <laughs> strawberries as a kid because that stuck with me. Um, my last surgery, I was on... 11 different medications and my goal was to get off of all of them. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening is some of them were very heavy, heavy pain drugs. 
And so when I went off of them, I went into withdrawal. Mm. And then I had to go and I wasn't sleeping. I was shaking. It was, it was, I was literally like detoxing. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go on uh, antidepressants to help me sleep, to help me get off the heavy narcotics. So I never dreamed that part of my journey would be spending a month trying to get unhooked from pain medication. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of things like that, or, you know, uh, they say, oh, you might feel discomfort if you cough. They don't tell you it feels like you're being ripped open when you cough. <laughs> so things things are stated in a very sterile way. That's right. not untrue, but it's not really it's not really painting an accurate picture. As you said that, I'm, I'm thinking about my chest cut open and me breathing, yeah. me sneezing, me yawning. You know what I mean? <laughs> All these natural things that your body do, you know what I mean? How painful that could have been. Was it? Sneezing was death. Sneezing was like being ripped in half. And oh basically they 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 gave you a technique. They said you hold a pillow and you squeeze it and you try and be as gentle as you can because it, it is extremely painful. Um, no, you won't rip apart, but it definitely feels like it. Oh, my God. What was sleeping like? Uh, couldn't sleep on your side. Um, so every, I was sleeping on my back like Dracula. And then because my bone has been sawed open so many times, I still get nerve. Like, I don't know how to say like the nerves will fire. And so it'll hurt sometimes, or it'll be uncomfortable. The, my chest bone is not like, it doesn't heal flat. So it's, it's a little bit off. And so uh, just little things like that where no, nobody could have told you that. And then sometimes when I do my own research, I find, wow, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I met a kid in hospital. His chest bone after surgery actually was swollen and would swell out. And then when I researched it, I thought, this is actually fairly common where kids' bones will actually swell. And, but I think if you knew that going in, if they told you every risk, I don't know how, well, I don't know if that would be better or not. It'd probably be stressful. Yeah. It'd be yeah. super stressful, man. As you approach life now, do you look at life in, in regards to like setting like milestones and goals and certain types of increments? Knowing that doctors have told you or that you could have been counted out and you're still here. And I'm asking that as in, it sounds like you're much more super, I'm not saying that you wasn't, but you're super appreciative of just life, your family, everything that you have for you and stuff like that. So did you, or have you created like, these are the, the bucket list things that I want to knock out in the next five years, next 10 years. These are the things that I'm going out. I'm going to write my book. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Is that something that you do for yourself? I have set lists and goals. Like one of my goals in my mid thirties was I want to earn a black belt in Mm jujitsu. And it seemed impossible. I didn't know how I would do it. And I had gotten up to about a brown belt level. And then I had my last open heart surgery. And then I really didn't know how that was going to happen, but I healed. I took it one step at a time and I got it. And then it's kind of like, okay, now what can I do? It's like when your car is on empty and you want to see, hey, can I drive another 20 miles? So I'd reach that that goal and I'm like, well, what else can I do? And so I've, in different areas, like physically, I've tried to push my limits. And yes, I definitely have limits. And there's areas where I know I I can't go past this. This is my limit. Um, but as far as long-term goals, there's a few that I've set, but kind of my barometer for whether or not I should do something is you kind of get hungry. Like what's, what's the next challenge or what's, what should I be doing? Cause I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm not just here to play video games and watch TV all day. Right. Like I need to be doing something to help somebody or to, improve the world around me. 
right. And generally my barometer is something will come to me. Hey, that's scary. That's okay. It. That's what I need to do. That's the thing. That's so it. I've tried in the past for, you know, recreationally, I tried bungee jumping. Okay. That's done. Skydiving. Yeah, that's done. But I, again, something scares you do it. Public speaking, do it. Whatever it is. Absolutely, man. I think I told you that's why I um, decided to step out of my comfort zone with a lot of things, you know, and, and um, venture off with this company, University Academy, because I just have really big goals and big dreams in regards to all the things that I want to do for this company and just been speaking it into existence. So absolutely, man. I agree with you. Just do it. Just like Nike. Just do it. <laughs> so you're now a marketer, graphic designer, businessman. Yep. What made you say, I'm going to step into the entrepreneur space. I'm going to start running a business. And what gave you that level of confidence to say, yes, I could do this. And this is what I'm going to go after and start helping people in this particular space. Um, I think I've, I've always started small. It's just, what is my interest? Mm -hmm. And is there a market for somebody who needs what I do? All right. And that's, that's what it was. My first graph design job and drawing job was when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And this nursing home hired me to make posters to encourage employees, employees to wash their hands. Mm -hmm. And it was just something very small. And then, you know, it gets bigger over time. And now the challenges stretch me. Like, I don't know if I can do this, but if I did, what would that look like? And even if I fail at it, my attitude is, well, I've, I've learned something new or I've learned what I can't do. And uh, I've taught art for a number of years as well as, as a part-time job as well. Mm -hmm. And I've encouraged my students, you know, try everything in the buffet because you're going to discover I'm good at this. I'm not good at this. I like this. I don't like this. But if you just sit back and overanalyze, you'll never figure it out. You have to go try it. And then you understand what you're good at, what you can do and what you can't do. So in every design job, creative job, marketing job I've had, I've just said, well, what, what, what could I fulfill? What could I, what role could I meet here? Am I up to the challenge? There have been things, yeah, I've had to turn it away because I realize this is way beyond me. But if it's a little stretch, mm -hmm. then you better do it because uh, it's 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 a bit like cold water immersion. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You'll get used to it, and then you'll get used to this, and then you'll get used to this. I heard about the cold water submersion. I don't know if I'm there yet, but I do try to uh, incorporate some cold showers, though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm there. <laughs> So when I wrote my book and when I started this company, when I started this podcast, I started realizing that it was contributing to my healing journey in regards to identifying myself, finding myself, being my true authentic self, and just really identifying what my true purpose is. For yourself, what is, what is uh what is that for you do you think based on the path that you're you're at now do you think the business is part of your journey healing journey do you think the jiu-jitsu is a part of your healing journey do you think the book is a part of your healing journey and if so like what is next on this path for you i do i d all of the above um i i look at it this way um my creative work challenges me creatively. It challenges my brain. And these days that's as good as a physical challenge because as long as I'm working my brain, that's keeping things moving. That's keeping me moving forward and not stagnating. But I've looked at it like this. Scenario number one, if I'm going to see myself as a victor, what does my marriage look like? Mm -hmm. What does my parenting look like? Mm -hmm. What does my home look like? If I'm going to be a victor, how am I leading in my church? What does it look like when I'm training in the dojo? How am I affecting my community? 
Now, if I'm a victim, what does my marriage look like? What does my home look like? What am I doing in my community? And so kind of to tie it back in, part of my journey with survivor's guilt is realizing you are alive. What are you going to do with it? Are you just going to play small or are you going to dare to step out and realize you're here for a purpose? And maybe that purpose is drive my daughter to the gym and have a great conversation and be an example. And that's my purpose for that day. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's to uh, this past weekend, I organized the walk for the heart and stroke foundation and we raised money and we did this incredible walk and people got out and we created awareness. That was my purpose for that day. But it's not to sit, sit at home and play small and feel sorry for myself. Absolutely, man. Can you talk about the importance of uh, self-care, self-worth, and just navigating the uh, the balance, if there's a such thing as balance, for yourself as uh, you're leading to this transformation of life, man? Like, you're nothing but inspiring, man. Can you talk about that for me? Um, I think with self-care, you... If you're if you're not acknowledging the areas that you're weak in or the areas that you're struggling in, how am I going to be an example? Um, how am I going to help others? I can't. So you take time for yourself so that you can then take time to help others. So if I for, like if I don't exercise, Okay, physically it's going to have an effect, but more my brain. Yeah. I I need that to operate at my best. If I'm not operating at my best, then it's going to affect all the areas of life that I outlined before. So self-care, I think, is getting the attention it needs to get now. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing selfish about saying, look, I need to do this so that I can serve better. Uh, and, and that's, that's huge. I've also learned like you have to, uh, you need to recharge because if you don't rest, you'll quit. So rather than me quitting something because I feel overwhelmed, maybe I just rest and that's my self care. And it's a challenge because it's a balance. It's, it's that balance between managing my family, managing this, managing business, you're not going to manage it well all the time. Sometimes right. you're going to be lopsided this way and you got to course correct. And one, one strategy that helped me a lot with self-care and managing all that was just asking my wife, hey, um, I've got these creative projects. Should I take them on? Do you feel like you're seeing enough of me lately? If she's like, yeah, we're good. Take them on. I'll see you, you know, take the time you need. Or sometimes she's like, you know what? We're not doing enough together. You know, then I turn it down or I charge a really high price so <laughs> that if I do it, it's worth the time invested. But it, like it's, you, it's, man. yeah, it's a constant battle and it's a constant course. Correct. It's, it's flying a plane, right? Sometimes the winds are contrary and you got to fight to get it back. I like it. So me and my wife, we do uh, monthly check-ins, and then me and another group of uh, entrepreneurs, we do we're uh, accountability partners, mm-hmm. and I love incorporating that into my life and my business, and that kind of helps me with like uh, sustainability and just um, just kind of like staying on par, you know. Yep. You, you're gonna say something. Go ahead. No, no, I was, I'm just agreeing with you. I'm, okay. I'm hearing you. So as you get ready to close up here, man, um, what's the legacy that you plan on uh, leaving behind um, with uh, your book, your uh, all of your future adver- um, adventures that you got coming up, man, um, business-wise as well? What's that legacy that you're going to leave, leave behind that's going to make an impact? It would be three words. That's it. Don't give up. That's it. 
if if my book is my legacy, if if when you close the last page, if that's the message you get, then I'm done. Um, man, don't give up. That that's it. Why? Because, like I said earlier, one day you'll tell your story of how you've overcome what you're going through now, and that will be somebody else's survival guide. And that's why whether, you know, I may not be the best martial artist, the fastest runner, uh, I don't have my ripped abs or, <laughs> but I can do, I can put in the time. And that to me is more important. It, it, to me, sometimes it's, it's less important that you achieve your goals than that you're working towards them. You don't quit trying. Right. And that's the message. Like, just don't give up. I agree, man. I love it, bro. So. Danny, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, man. I, uh, I've heard a lot of stories. Never heard one quite like this. Um, seriously, man, I, I've never heard of anyone been through so many surgeries and still here to live to talk about it. And one of the most positive, uplifting persons that I've spoken to when it comes to having this type of surgery. There's so many people that could have went south, could have been doing a whole bunch of blaming. And you chose not to do so, man. So thank you for coming on here, being totally transparent and just being vulnerable and just um, sharing your experience and uh, your lessons that you've had in your life, man, with our audience. So I just want to tell you, thank you for that. man. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, I'll definitely keep you posted on when the book comes out. Absolutely, man. Uh, I will go out and pick up a copy. I probably would want a signed copy, but uh... <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, if anybody wanted to uh, work with you, Danny, they want to get you on another podcast, get you to speak about your story. Um, anybody want to work with you um, to do business with your company or anything like that? How can I get, get a hold of you? Probably the easiest way is just reach out to me on my website. It's dannycovey.com. Um, other than that, I'm very easy to find online, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. I'm Just type in my name, you'll find me. All right, guys, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank Danny for just stopping by and just sharing his story. Until next time, guys, we love you. Peace. Can't complain at all. Couple dollars in my pocket, no income and go. Been working on my body, getting healthier. Thank God for clarity.